power isn't even being used in the Pacific Northwest. It's headed hundreds of miles due south to California, which already imports more electricity than any other state. California law mandates that by 2020, a third of its power must come from renewable energy sources. And Deborah Levine, who is responsible for bringing power to 30 million Californians, is already seeing the impact of this change. What's going on with the renewables now? It's exactly opposite of yesterday. The wind is at 140 megawatts. Yesterday, it was about 2,000 megawatts. This brand new control room which oversees most of the state's electric grid, is the first in the country to have a team devoted to deciphering the ups and downs of wind power. But there's a lot they simply can't control. If a wind blows too hard, 50 miles an hour, the wind turbines stop. That's so counterintuitive because you, you'd think that to have more wind power, you want more wind. And so then what happens? We need to make it up. People still want their electricity. So we need to have fossil generation on standby, able to pick up to ensure that the demand is still served. You actually have to have more conventional power sources online to pick up the slack if the wind dies. We'll need something to pick up the slack if the wind dies. Mother nature is always going to be mother nature. It's, you can't count on it. Over 30 states now have renewable energy targets. It's just one part of an ongoing fight to change how we consume energy. But it's a tremendous challenge, especially when we're losing the battle right in our homes. I'm high above Cleveland on a cold winter night. What I'm seeing reveals a lot about how we all waste power without even noticing. With over a working class neighborhood in Cleveland. Larry Davis is a thermal mapping expert whose highly sensitive camera mounted on the bottom of this plane captures heat radiating from objects on the ground. I would say that the majority of energy that's being wasted comes from everyday consumers like you or me in our houses. The orange and reddish colors indicate that there's a substantial amount of heat loss. About half the homes in Cleveland were built before 1950. On average, they're 40% less efficient than homes built in the last 10 years. But even better insulated modern homes still lose a tremendous amount of energy simply because of their size and the huge amount of power they need. They're gonna get larger as we cross this road. Their modern size, the kind you might see in suburbia, are still losing a substantial amount of heat energy. All across America, inefficiencies in our homes are costing us nearly $60 billion each year. Our path takes us over new houses, older construction, industrial zones, acres of greenhouses, a nuclear power plant, and Cleveland's downtown. The city explodes in Larry's screen like an inferno. This is a really eye-opening experience. I never saw so much heat or energy loss happening everywhere you look. But the thing that's really boggling my mind is the fact that we're wasting so much heat and energy underscores the fact that we're using massive amounts of energy to begin with. Well, that's right. We're, we're consumers, literally, from the time we're born to the time we die. There's no way to get around it. The amount of energy involved is spectacular. Beginning in 1994, for the first time, American homes and offices began to consume more electricity than American industry. It's an addiction we can't seem to shake. The main electricity users are no longer aluminum smelters, steel mills, or car factories. It's you and me. To meet our energy needs, innovative pioneers are coming up with new ways to generate power in the most unexpected places. In the heart of Vermont's dairy country, meet the new power plants at the Blue Spruce Farm. All 2,400 of them. Okay, here we go. Time for these babies to go get milked. All right, I'm holding my breath. <laughs> Marie Adet is a second-generation dairy farmer who doesn't let anything go to waste on her farm. But her cows produce a lot of waste, and she's found a brand new way to use it. We used to put the raw manure back on our land as fertilizer. Okay. So is that going to be used to make electricity too? It sure 
whatever it is, baby, go for it. <laughs> These cows produce an energy resource that you don't have to dig, drill, ship, or pipe in. But a shovel does come in handy. It's funny, I've been going around the country learning about how we generate energy, and this is the last place I would imagine where you'd actually be making electricity. But it turns out that manure is a valuable source of power thanks to its natural byproduct, methane gas. The manure gets collected in the barns and pumped to a nearby storage tank called a digester. The digester is 14 feet deep, filled with 12 feet of manure, and the top two feet is where those methane gases collect. It's a big concrete swimming pool with a concrete cover. The methane powers a generator, sending electricity directly onto the grid to 400 homes. It's part of a larger program called Cow Power that serves more than 3,000 customers. And unlike the ups and downs of solar and wind, these cows provide a constant source of electricity. We're here to make milk. That's what we're good at. But as a byproduct, you know, when those cows are pooping, we're making this gas that's not a good greenhouse gas. So we're actually improving the environment while we're making electricity. But if you're thinking in terms of the total energy needs in this country, I mean, this is barely making a dent. I and mean, we have, what, 300 million Americans who are all consuming energy. How does this make a difference? Our renewable energy needs are going to come from a variety of resources. It's not going to be one magic bullet. It's going to take all kinds of innovative ideas from all facets for us to come to a solution. Vermont is the first state with a utility that's banking on cow power. But it doesn't come cheap. Customers have to pay a premium to make up for the cost of installing the technology. The system cost Marie and her farm over a million dollars, which they paid off in just seven years. If this is working so well for you, how come everyone's not doing this? Well, it takes more than just the dairy farmer to get this done. We can't do it on our own, you know? The margin on milk is always kind of tight, and in order to build the facility that's needed, to capture all this methane and turn it into electricity, it requires a huge capital investment. Community stepped up and said, we want to pay more for cow power. And it's become much bigger than we initially ever dreamed that it was going to be. Let's face it, we're not going to run the country on cow power alone. It would take more than four million cows to equal the output of just one nuclear power plant. But maybe that's not the point. Maybe the point here is that the people in this community are taking control of their energy choices and they're choosing to build a sustainable energy future one kilowatt at a time. And it's not just happening in Vermont. All across the country, communities are taking greater control of where their electricity comes from and how it's being used. That brings me to Florida Avenue Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. Pastor Earl Trent and his congregation are turning to solar energy. They've got their own power plant up on the church roof. This is the entire system. There are 44 of them. And it's very, very basic and very simple. When people think about solar power system, they're thinking about something complicated. But as you see, they're just angled panels sun hits them and then it turns into current. Unlike massive solar arrays that can generate electricity for thousands of people, the church's system is pretty modest, but it saves them $400 a month. It represents a small but growing trend that's changing how we get our power. Over the last two years, more than 100,000 families have installed solar panels throughout America. This is only the first step in a green ministry. It's going to be an education about energy efficiency, renewable energy, and conservation. The system cost $60,000 to put in and would have been out of reach without government subsidies and donations from church members. You can't realistically expect that everyone in your congregation is going to put up a solar panel, right? So, I mean, what are you trying to do here? What we're trying to do is change their thinking so that they will become more energy efficient uh, in their own homes. This is a catalyst, and that's what we want. 
you know, this is a start. The fact is, finding innovative ways to power the grid is still a work in progress. But my travels across America have shown me that there's a new energy awareness that's starting to take hold, and it's revealing itself in surprising ways. Which takes me full circle back to where my journey began. You might not know it by looking around this racetrack, but even NASCAR is trying to make a dent in its energy consumption. In Pennsylvania, they've built the largest solar-powered sports facility in the world. And the gasoline they're using? In 2011, for the first time, all their cars began running on an experimental blend of 15% corn ethanol to offset their fossil fuel use. NASCAR has a long way to go, but they want to be racing 100 years from now. To do this, they know they're going to have to make some fundamental changes, just like the rest of us. And it's not just here. Keeping the power flowing will take creative solutions. We need to find new sources of energy for tomorrow, and we need to use existing ones more efficiently today. There are no easy answers, but there are a lot of new ideas out there ready to be harnessed. But today is race day in Daytona. That means it's time to put pedal to the metal. Celebrate the great American energy machine. It's a machine we depend on every day. To keep it going, we can't take it for granted. America Revealed is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.